Well, welcome everyone to the League of Women Voters voter registration training. My name is Elizabeth Greaser. I know some of you, um, but for those I don't know, I am the operations manager at the Metropolitan Columbus League of Women Voters. I am the only staff person and we have about 400 members and volunteers that carry out most of our voter registration and voter outreach activities. And that is why we hold these voter registration trainings um, so that you all can feel comfortable registering voters and volunteering at some of our outreach events this summer and fall. So at the end of this training, I will give you information on how you can sign up for some of our voter outreach events. Of course, this training is open to all community members. So even if you're just here to get some information about voting, you are certainly welcome. If you're not familiar with the League of Women Voters, we are a 101 year old civic organization. We are a nonprofit and we are nonpartisan. That means we never support or oppose any political parties or candidates. We are especially careful about that when it comes to voter registration. Our mission is to register everyone um, that is able to vote, make sure that they're informed voters, that they have the information they need to make their own decisions, and they know where to go to vote on election day or vote ahead of time. So we are a resource for voters and we try and get information out there. Hopefully my, oh, there we go. So what are we gonna talk about tonight? So this is a pretty general training. We're not gonna be talking about candidates running for election in November or specific issues. This training is for how to go out and register voters and answer frequently asked questions. So we'll go over who can vote in Ohio, the different ways you can register to vote, how you can check to see if someone's registered or not. We'll also talk about absentee ballot applications, which get a little complicated here in Ohio and the different voting options for November. And then we'll talk a little bit more about registering voters out in the fields, best practices, and some FAQs that you may get if you are registering voters. So we'll start with who can vote. You need to be a US citizen. You have to be an Ohio resident 30 days by election day. This this one, it really isn't too important because the voter registration deadline in Ohio is 30 days before election day. So if someone's an Ohio resident on the day they're registering, then you could just go ahead and register them. If you are going to be 18 by election day, you can vote. That means if you're currently 17 and your birthday is September 30th, you can go ahead and register today, August 5th, I think it is. Uh, you don't have to wait until you turn 18. I think one of the most important things to remember from this slide is that in Ohio, if you're not currently serving time, so in prison for a felony conviction, you can vote. The reason this gets a little confusing is because other states have different rules. So in some states, if you have a felony conviction at all, even if you've already served your time, you can no longer vote ever for the rest of your life. Um, so many people that have felony convictions on their records think that they cannot vote in Ohio, but they can. The one caveat to keep in mind is that after you have served time in prison, you will have to re-register to vote. So when you are convicted and put in jail, your registration stops and you have to re-register when you come out. So this comes up pretty frequently when we are doing community festivals and community events. So please keep that in mind. So I'd like to talk about a few special populations that have a few different rules when it comes to registering. Not necessarily different rules, but different things to keep in mind. So 
The first is registering homeless individuals. You do not need to have a permanent address uh, in order to vote. You can register based on um, the address of a homeless shelter that you're staying at or a local community organization such as a church that regularly serves free meals or a food pantry. Any organization that is willing to accept mail on your behalf, you can register at. You can even technically register at, um, for example, the park bench on the corner of Main Street and Broad Street. That is technically a valid registration. But we don't recommend that because there's no mailbox at the corner of um, Main Street and Broad Street and it just makes things a little more complicated. So the address needs to be um, at an organization that will accept mail on the person's behalf. There is not a perfect way to vote um, for homeless individuals. So there's barriers kind of each way you decide to go. The two ways being you can vote on election day. The barrier for homeless individuals on election day is that you will have to show a physical ID, whether that is a driver's license, a state ID, um, a bank statement, you know, there's there's a whole list of IDs that, that um, you can show on election day, but many individuals that are homeless will not have that kind of um, ID on them. So the other option is that they can vote early or they can vote absentee. And in that case, you won't need to show a physical ID. All you will have to do is fill out some forms with your date of birth and the last four digits of your social security number. The barriers in that case being that if you want to vote early in person, the only place to do that is the Franklin County Board of Elections office up on Morse Road, which may not be very convenient um, you may not have transportation to get up there. Uh, the other way is you can do mail-in absentee voting, um, but you will have to come back and check your mail regularly um, and collect mail several times, kind of a back and forth process that we'll get into in a little bit. So that, that's a pretty long explanation, but if you do sign up for a registration event in which we go to a homeless shelter, We'll provide more information um, and guidance for you when registering these um, individuals. Okay, the second population is college students. College students are, are special when it comes to voter registration because they can choose whether to register their campus address or their parents' address. And they can change their registration each year or each election cycle, um, depending on where they prefer to vote. So for example, if um, your parents live in Cleveland and you're going to school at Ohio State, there may be a local issue up in Cuyahoga County that you feel really connected with and you wanna vote up in Cuyahoga County this year, but then the reverse may be true next year. And so you can kind of flip flop around as long as you're only registered in one location. The, some questions we often get when it comes to registering college students are about driver's license and your address on your driver's license will, does not need to match your campus address. And um, also your federal, your federal financial aid is not going to be impacted um, if you register to vote in Ohio. Does anyone have questions on any particular population or person who can or can't vote in Ohio? I do. Sure. Um, could you, I'm sorry, hi, I'm Karen. Hello, everybody. Um, could you go back one slide, please? Sure. And also I was wondering, will we, can we get a copy of this PowerPoint? Or? Yes, okay. afterwards I will send out a copy of the PowerPoint and let me see if I can. There was something that there. 
Oh, when you said, that's what I was trying to figure out. You said that, that the college students can choose election by election where to register. But if I, if I were a college student and I chose the last election from my permanent address, and then this election for my campus address, I mean, doesn't, doesn't that look like two, that I'm registered in two places or does the date yeah. of that? So what will happen the is one? the first time you register to vote, the, your local board of elections will input it into the system and that's a statewide database of voter registration. And then if the next election you choose to vote in a different county or city, you can go online or fill out a form um, to just update your address in the system. So, okay, it, so it's it, just... yeah, so it'll just, um, it'll keep your same profile, but just update your address to make sure that you're only registered once. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I had a quick question um, <laughs> about the definition of a college student. Does that include graduate professional students as well? Or is that, are those rules specific to undergrad? No, it, it in, can include graduate students as well. It's um, a fairly vague rule, I would say. Anyone who considers themselves um, a student then has a permanent address elsewhere. So I normally when I, I'm sorry, someone say something? Yeah, I had a question. Sure. Out of state students can visit can vote in Ohio elections. That's correct. If they register at their campus address, they have to have an Ohio address. So they would can so they can consider themselves Ohio residents for the purposes of voting, even mm -hmm. if they don't necessarily consider themselves Ohio residents uh, residents for the purpose of college tuition or for their license plate on their car, license registration, things like that. Interesting, okay, didn't know that. That's why you see, well, one of the reasons you see um, so many people trying to register voters on college campuses in the big election years, especially the presidential years in swing states. So that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons. Never occurred to me when I was going to school in Pennsylvania that I could vote there. Yes. <laughs> so. And most, most students don't realize that, um, but um, it is kind of an interesting rule that we have here in Ohio. Hmm. So when I do this training in person, I hand out to everyone a copy of the voter registration form. Since we're doing this via Zoom, I have chopped it up into three different slides so that you can see what it looks like. But the next three slides are all one form. So this is the top of the form. You can use this form to register voters for the first time. You can use the same form to update someone's address, like someone's already registered, but they've moved. You can also use this form to change someone's name on their voter registration. So if they've gotten married or divorced or change their name for whatever reason, you can use this form for all three uh, instances. The first two questions are often missed by voters who are filling it out. It needs to be checkmarked. I've had the Board of Elections return forms to me because the two boxes are not checked. Uh, the rest of this is mostly, you know, name, address, Box eight is the county where you live instead of the country. Box nine and 10 need to be filled out. That's the birth date and your Ohio driver's license number or the last four digits of your social. Second middle portion of the form. This only needs to be filled out if you are updating someone's address or changing someone's name. Otherwise you can just leave it blank. And then we have the bottom portion of the form. Uh, you need to make sure that the signature fits within the dotted line, the dotted box. The Board of Elections will take these completed forms and scan them into their system. And if someone's 
signature is outside of the box, then it doesn't show up um, and then it's not, not valid. So these are, um, you know, I'm going over all of these details because when you are registering voters at events, you're usually talking to them at the same time. They're trying to fill out this form. Um, people get distracted and you would really be surprised how many times people make mistakes, leave out information um, that needs to be completed. So we talked about some of these, um, but you, <clears throat> a couple other errors to, to watch out for is to make sure that someone is using an actual physical address instead of a PO box. The reason being that the Board of Elections will assign a polling location based on your physical address and they can't assign that if you just put in a PO box. Another one that's really important is to make sure that voter is writing legibly. The Board of Elections, maybe not so much this year, but in even year elections, they get thousands and thousands of these forms and they have to process them. And if they can't read them, then sometimes they can just go into the trash. So make sure the voter is printing legibly. I usually take a minute after the voters filled it out to ask them if they can just wait for a minute while I look it over and make sure that everything's there. Once the voter leaves, you are not allowed to make any changes to the form. The voter is allowed to kind of cross something out that's um, inaccurate, write in the accurate information and, and initial that, that's fine. Another rule that to keep in the back of your mind is that if the voter is present, you are allowed to fill out the form for them, except for the signature portion. So even if the signature is an X, that's the voter's signature, they need to make that themselves, but you are allowed to complete the rest of the form for them. So what happens next? I'd like to let the voters know what's gonna happen next. If you are returning someone else's form for them, you have 10 days after the date that the registration form is completed to return it to the Board of Elections office. And here that's on Morse Road. Or you have to return it by the voter registration deadline, which this year is October 4th. So if you have are volunteering at an event on October 1st, you need to make sure you get that in by October 4th. After the voter has completed the registration form, the Board of Elections has 20 business days to process the form. I always let people know that's 20 business days, so really that can be like a month um, to get in, a mail, get in the mail to you information about your precinct, your polling location, and the ID requirements for voting. So we've just gone over how to register using the hard copy form. And the, you know, I do that so that you, know, you can get a sense of all the information that's needed. But since January, 2017, we can also here in Ohio register to vote online through the Secretary of State's website. And any individual in all 88 counties, they all go to the same site and I'm gonna include this information um, in a follow-up email to you so you'll, you'll have the website. It takes all of the same information that the form does. The um, only down, not downside, but <clears throat> potential problem with registering online for individuals that are new to Ohio is that if you do not already have a profile in the state of Ohio's database, and that can be through the DMV, that can be through paying Ohio state taxes. Um, if you don't have a profile, you won't be recognized by the system and you won't be allowed to register online. So this can come into play, let's say you just moved here from Montana, you've had no contact with the state of Ohio before this, you'll have to fill out a hard copy registration form and get that to your county board of elections. We 
because sometimes we get questions about whether you should promote online voter registration or hard copy form registration if you are out at events. Um, the league's general rule is that if we are have a table at a community festival or we're outside um, you know, talking to people, we usually use the paper forms. One being that our manner of, our, our kind of process is that we will turn in the forms for the voters if they want us to. So that makes that easier. Um, you don't have to worry about kind of trying to tell the voter about the online website. It's hard to walk someone through it if they're just using their phone and then you have to lean over them and it, it, you can't really maintain social distance that way. Um, but definitely we encourage people to register any way that they want to, um, especially if you know, you're know you sharing information on social media with your friends or you know, you can just let them know that they can register online. So any questions about just like regular registration before we move on? Okay, so now we're gonna back up a little bit. We covered registration, but the first thing that we usually urge league volunteers to do at voter outreach events is actually ask voters if they've checked their voter registration status recently. So instead of saying, hey, are you registered? In which most people will just say yes and move on. You can start with the question of, hey, have you checked your voter registration status lately? Um, and that tends to be more of a conversation opener. And there's a number of reasons why we do that besides just starting the conversation. One is that in Ohio, we have regular voter purges. The last one was this January, about 98,000 Ohioans were purged from the voter rolls. And this happens for a lot of reasons. So um, the state regularly purges the rolls for people that have moved out of state, um, that have passed away. There's, there's a lot of reasons why we want to clean up the voter rolls. We have had some issues in the past of voters being purged that weren't supposed to be purged. And that's one of the things that the league does is kind of go through and double check after each purge happens, um, whether or not the voters were supposed to be purged or not, and then try and contact those voters and get them back on the rolls. Um, but the general rule that was upheld by the US Supreme Court is that if a voter has not voted um, in two years, they get sent a postcard. And if they don't respond or vote in the remaining four years, then they can be purged from the rolls. So you can also be purged for, for inactivity. And that is why the best practice is just to verify that everyone's registration is current. And you can do this very easily online. There is a website for that through the Secretary of State's office. All you need to put in is the person's first name, last name, and county. So you don't even have to ask for any personal information other than name. Once you push search, it'll bring up, um, hopefully, that person's name and current address. So if I put in my own name, Elizabeth Greaser, Franklin County, I would then ask, is, you know, is 70 East Southington Avenue your current address? And then they'll either say, yes, it is. And if that's the case, then they're registered at their current address, they're all set. Or if they say, no, I actually moved um, a couple years ago and now I live at, you know, X, Y, Z, then you will know that they're registered, but they need to update their address. So they can either do that using the form that we talked about or online. And then if you put in their name and nothing comes up, that means that they are not registered to vote in Ohio and they need to hopefully get registered. Any questions about that? Okay. 
So let's go on to voting options. After we've registered people, we like to let them know when the next election is and what their voting options are. So the next election in Franklin County is going to be November 2nd. Polls will be open 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. and you will vote at your local polling location. The second option is to vote early in person. That begins about a month before election day. The only location you can do that at is the Board of Elections office. It's generally business hours, but there are some weekend hours the last two weekends before election day. And then the third option is absentee or mail-in voting, which also starts about a month before election day. And it has to be post by November 1st to count. On even year elections, the board of uh, the Secretary of State will mail out absentee ballot application forms to all registered voters. I do not believe they are doing that this year. It's an odd year election. They don't normally do so. And I haven't heard any like murmurings that they're going to do that this year. So um, that means that absentee voting is going to be a multi step process. But it is a good option, um, especially if people have COVID concerns um, or they just um, wanna get their ballot and be able to sit and think about it for a while before they vote. We had a lot of people, a record amount of voters here in Ohio use the absentee ballot last year for the 2020 general election. So there, like I said, it's a multi-step process and it can be a little cumbersome. You cannot request an absentee ballot online. You have to print out, sign, and mail an application uh, to the, your local Board of Elections. Once the Board of Elections receives your application, they will send you back a ballot. You'll fill that out, and you will either drop it off or mail it back to the Board of Elections office. So it requires several stamps. It requires some follow through. Um, so just kind of make sure people are aware of, of all the steps that are involved if they want to do absentee voting. I've got a question about the request yes. for an absentee ballot. Um, are there blank ones that we can have people fill out and they can mail them in or do you have to fill it out online and print? No. Um, so we definitely, we have at all of our events, we have blank copies of absentee ballot applications. And this is actually what it looks like. The picture on the screen is what it looks like. Um, you can fill one out online, but then it will prompt you to print it out so sure. you can sign it. Okay. Um, but most, it's usually starting around September. All the local libraries will have copies of this as well. Um, and of course, you can go to the Board of Elections and get as yep. many copies so as you want. Uh, if you fill one out, like if I was out uh, registering people and I had 15 people fill one of these out, could I take them to the Board of Elections or do they have to be mailed? Oh, no, yes, good, great question, thank you. Yes, you can take someone else's absentee ballot application to the Board of Elections. Okay. Um, but there's an important distinction, which I think that you were trying, that you were getting at, which is that you as a, um, volunteer cannot take someone else's ballot back to the board of elections for them uh -huh. unless you're an immediate family member right so um registration forms and absentee ballot requests which is what this is on the screen and uh, you know you can take as many of those completed applications as you want to the board of elections but not the ballots themselves thank you so the absentee ballot application, it's pretty similar to the voter registration form. Um, you know, the, the big thing I point out to people is that you can have this absentee ballot mailed to where whatever address you want. So if you're going to be on vacation in California for the whole month, uh, for the whole, you know, two months of October, and November, you can have the absentee ballot mailed to California. Um, as long as you put your permanent address here in Ohio, you can vote from California and mail it back to Ohio. 
you the only ID you need to put in is your Ohio driver's license or the last four digits of your social along with your date of birth. And then of course sign it. One of the um, interesting tools that Ohio has is a tracker for your absentee ballot. And most people I talk to aren't aware of this, but it is a little bit like tracking an Amazon package. So you can go on the Franklin County Board of Elections website. They use a system called Ballot Tracks. You can sign up to get notifications whenever um, your absentee ballot hits a certain milestone. So you'll get a text or an email when the absentee ballot application is received by the Board of Elections. Uh, second, when the absentee ballot is mailed back to you from the Board of Elections. And then a third, when your absentee ballot is received back to the Board of Elections. So that's just a way of getting some confirmation that your absentee ballot has made it there, um, that you know that your vote has been um, received and processed. Do any other counties have that? Yes, all counties in Ohio. All counties, have, okay. Some, um, each, some counties have a little bit different way that they do it. That's why I put the specific Franklin County link. Um, but the Secretary of State's website has links to all the different counties and the trackers. And I've used this a number of times and it's worked great for me. So as long as the voter is a little bit tech savvy um, and <laughs> which um, pre pre presents its own problems, but um, you know, if you have an email account or you get text messages, this has worked really well for me in the past. Okay, so a little bit about what's on the ballot in November. It's what we consider here an off-year election, but that doesn't mean that voting still isn't important. Um, actually, in some ways, when you think about it, it's even more important because you're voting on very local issues and your vote, I'm gonna use the word counts in quotation marks, um, more than on a national um, election because there are fewer voters voting and um, you'll be voting on city council and city school boards, which decides a lot of very important local issues. So I just looked up today what the issues are and it really varies from city to city here in Franklin County, but there's some fire and police le levies, there's city charter amendments, there's quite a few for Bexley city um, and then there's one school levy for Reynoldsburg. And then if you live in the 15th congressional district, which is the Western, maybe Western third Franklin County, you'll be voting on your congressional representative. Okay, these are some related and upcoming issues that you may uh, hear about as you're doing um, some voter outreach. One is that there are some pending Ohio voting legislation, HB 294, which would change some of these voting rules. The Ohio legislature is on their summer recess. By the time they get back in September, they won't be able to, even if they enacted HB 294, it would not affect voting rules for 2021. It's just too late for that. Um, so if someone brings that up, you can say that it won't have effect for 2021. Uh, you know, if it does pass, um, it, you know, the league is generally against this voting legislation. We think it will make voting harder, especially for underserved communities. It takes away some of the early voting days. Um, it puts more ID requirements on voting, there's many, many parts of this legislation. And if you follow us on social media, you will be hearing more about this once the summer recess for the legislators is complete. But that that could be something that you hear about because you know nationally there's been a lot of news coverage on state voting laws 
um, and how they have been restricting voting rights. Another thing that may be coming up, um, that may come up during some of your events is that Columbus City Council is in the process of districting for the first time. That's happening this year. They're going to be increasing from seven to nine council members. And instead of all of the council members being at large representing everybody in the city, they're going to be separated into districts. Um, the primaries will be conducted in each district, but all Columbus voters will vote um, for each district in the general election. It's a little, I feel like it's a little confusing, um, but districts are being drawn right now and the maps will be available by the end of 21, 2021. That will affect elections moving forward 2022 and beyond. It will not affect elections this year. Um, but if someone does bring that up, you know, you can let people know that Columbus is in the process of going from at large to districts. Um, and since we are voting on Columbus City Council candidates this year, this does not impact the candidates um, and who you can vote for in 2021. So more information on this will be upcoming um, later this year. Okay, so if you uh, register, I'm sorry, volunteer for some of our league volunteer events, we provide information materials. The first is vote411.org. That's where we have our nonpartisan candidate and issue guide. We also have voter information sheets, uh, mostly dealing with the special populations that we covered earlier. We have voting one, two, three cards, which I have a picture of here. This is last year's card, but this year's has been updated with the appropriate dates. We use this piece of material the most um, because it has all of the relevant dates, early voting hours. It shows where to find information about candidates and how to register online and all of the ID requirements you will need to vote. Oop. Okay, sorry, I went a little bit too fast. As we get closer to election day and voting, we also have information on election protection, which is a 1-800 number. Um, it's a nationwide number that collects information on the, when people have problems voting. So if they're turned away from the polls for whatever reason, um, they're told that they have to vote provisionally or that they're not allowed to vote at this location. Um, we encourage everybody to report any problems they have voting to this election protection number, which is also listed on the voting one, two, three card. Okay, so we've gone through most of the, most of the, the training information. And if you are interested in volunteering with us, I had a few events that need volunteers for next week. And I will be sending this out tomorrow with all the follow-up information from this training. Um, but we have an event at the NSI Food Pantry. It's a backpack giveaway. Um, this is Wednesday, next Wednesday. The OSU Medical College is having a Women's Health Day on Thursday. And then we have another food pantry we're going to on, it's between Dublin and Worthington, Smoky Road Food Pantry. And it's very early on Saturday morning for those people that like to get up early. <laughs> um, but well, these are just- hi, the, date, the date for Women's Health Day is August 12th. Oh, you're right, I'm sorry, Thursday, August 12th. And this is just a sampling of what we have next week, but we will have many, many volunteer events from now until voter registration, the voter registration deadline, which is um, the first week of October. Um, so if you, the best way to hear about our upcoming volunteer opportunities is to get our Monday morning email. 
and I will include information about that in the follow-up as well. But if you'd like to receive that, you can just reply back to the email and I'll make sure that you are signed up. So the, Elizabeth, yes. Sorry, will that include some information, like some particulars, like how many hours, are, you know, is voting broken into certain chunks or, you know, in terms of time frame? Yes. That so, kind of thing, so you know what you're getting yourself into. Yes. <laughs> Generally, I break shifts down into two hours, okay. two hour segments, but um, it's pretty flexible. So if you are available for an hour and a half or an hour on a certain day and you want to sign up and you just let me know, you know, that's usually fine. Okay, thanks. And most of the, um, the events will be outside we have had to be pretty agile these last couple of years with COVID going up and down about how we are um, handling voter registration. Um, so at this point, we're sticking mostly with outside registration events. Um, you know, we encourage all our volunteers to be vaccinated and, you know, to, um, you know, if, you're, if you want to, you can bring a mask, we'll have hand sanitizer um, and things like that. Oh, went one too far again. So a few frequently asked questions. We went over some of these, but um, one question is, do I have to register for every election? The answer is no. But if you haven't voted for several years, you need to check your voter registration and make sure that you're still registered because you can be pulled off the rolls for voting too infrequently. Some people always ask if or say that they don't want to be registered because then they'll be called for jury duty. But an interesting fact is that in Ohio, if you are a licensed driver or a taxpayer, you're already in the jury pool. So you might as well register to vote too. Let's see, we covered both of these. Uh, if you moved or changed your name, you do need to be registered. And we covered that one as well, let's see. And I think we already talked about this. If a voter, voter registration application is incomplete, can we write the missing information with the consent of the applicant? You can do that as long as they are still there. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that you cannot offer an incentive or a prize for someone to complete a voter registration form. So if you have candy or if you have coffee at your voter registration table, those have to be available to anyone, whether or not they register to vote. Okay, this is I'm going to skip this because that's for primaries. We don't need to muddy the waters anymore. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now to see if anyone has any questions or more information I can share. One last point, I almost forgot this, but we are again this year working on an initiative to do voter registration inside the county jails. Um, and we are looking for some volunteers that might be interested. We have a couple volunteers that are organizing um, with the county jails to see what that would look like. Last year, what that looked like was us sending 1,600 um, letters to the inmates at the Franklin County jails with voter registration forms and then going um, and, and picking those up. So it was all socially distanced. In the other years, it has involved volunteers going into the jails and registering the inmates in person and then making sure that those registration forms get back to the Board of Elections um, and then different or the same volunteers going back later, usually the weekend before election day to actually assist the inmates in 
completing their ballots and making sure those got back to the Board of Elections. So that's a special project we're working on. Um, and that's in, it, in addition to just all of our regular voter outreach. So if you are specifically interested in that, um, helping with that population, you can um, let me know about that and I will connect you with the um, people that are organizing that in Franklin County. But if there aren't any other questions, I appreciate everyone's time on a lovely yeah, August I, evening. I have a quick question. Sure. Okay, I know there's some place I can look to see who else might be signed up at the same time I am, but I'm not sure where that is. Ah, okay. Um, so Nancy, what Nancy's talking about is that um, I use Sign Up Genius to organize all of our league volunteers and the events. Um, and there is a specific address where you can look up and see if someone else is, is volunteering with you. Okay. Um, and Nancy, I will get that to you after, Thank you. after this training. Thank um, you. But if you do want to, go ahead, Karen. No, oh, just, could, could, yeah, finish your discussion. <laughs> no, no discussion. Just <laughs> go ahead. Um, so I, I've been a member of the League of Women Voters for some time, and that's how I found my entree into the training. Are you open to volunteers who aren't League members? Yes, you do not have to be a League member to volunteer okay. with us. Um, if you are, and if you are like a first time volunteer, you can note that on the sign up form and I will make sure that usually I can tell if you're a first time volunteer because I don't recognize your name, but um, I will make sure you are paired up with someone who is more experienced um, that, that can help you out. And we do try and always go out in pairs if we, if we can. Okay, thank, and I, I assumed I would generate some conversation with friends and maybe some interest. Yes, in yes, of course. And way. we yeah. do have people that you know, sign up with a neighbor and go out and do a yeah. particular event. And that's, we welcome that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ellen? Elizabeth, yeah, where's the recording going to be if we have people, if we know people that couldn't come tonight but are still interested? I will send you the link probably tomorrow morning and then you can just click on it and it'll, it'll go. I can probably stop the recording now. Okay, and then are you gonna put that in the e-voter too for, um... Yeah, I think so. I think that that's that's a good idea. Good idea. So, uh, at these uh, 